So is there some technical details about how to make some of these models, how to make the chat fast, how to make the diffs fast? Is there something that just jumps to mind? Yeah, I mean, so we can go over a lot of the strategies that we use. One interesting thing is cache warming. Um, and so what you can do is if, as the user is typing, you can have, yeah, you know, you're, you're probably going to use uh, some piece of context and you can know that before the user's done typing. So, you know, as we discussed before, reusing the KV cache results in lower latency, lower cost uh, across requests. So as the user starts typing, you can immediately warm the cache with like, let's say the current file contents. And then when they press enter, uh, there's very few tokens it actually has to pre-fill and compute before starting the generation. This will significantly lower TTFD. Can you explain how KV cache works? Yeah. So the way transformers work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I mean, one, <laughs> like one of, the, one of the mechanisms that allow transformers to not just independently, like the mechanism that allows transformers to not just independently look at each token, but see previous tokens are the keys and values to tension. And Generally, the way attention works is you have at your current token some query, and then you've all the keys and values of all your previous tokens, which are some kind of representation that the model stores internally of all the previous tokens in the prompt. And like by default, when you're doing a chat, the model has to, for every single token, do this forward pass through the entire uh, model. That's a lot of matrix multiplies that happen, and that is really, really slow. Instead, if you have already done that and you stored the keys and values and you keep that in the GPU, then when I'm, let's say I have sorted for the last n tokens, if I now want to compute the, the output token for the n plus one token, I don't need to pass those first n tokens through the entire model because I already have all those keys and values. And so you just need to do the forward pass through that last token. And then when you're doing attention, uh, you're reusing those keys and values that have been computed, which is the only kind of sequential part um, or sequentially dependent part of the transformer. Is there like higher level caching of like caching of the prompts or that kind of stuff that I see. could help? Yeah, that, that, th there's other types of caching you can kind of do. Um, one interesting thing that you can do for cursor tab is you can basically predict ahead as if the user would have accepted the suggestion and then trigger another uh, request. And so then you've cached, you've done the speculative, it's, it's a mix of speculation and caching, right? Because you're speculating what would happen if they accepted it. And then you have this value that is cached, this, this uh, suggestion. And then when they press tab, the next one would be waiting for them immediately. It's a, it's a kind of clever heuristic slash trick. Uh, that uses a higher level caching and, and can give uh, the, it, it feels fast despite there not actually being any changes in the in the model. And, and if you can make the KV cache smaller, one of the advantages you get is like, maybe maybe you can speculate even more. Maybe you can guess here's the 10 things that you know could be useful. I don't like uh, like predict the next 10 and, and then like it's possible the user hits the, the one of the 10. It's like much higher chance than the user hits like the exact one that you show them. Uh, maybe they type another character in, and we sort of hit hit something else in the cache. Yeah. So there's there's all these tricks where um, uh, the the general phenomena here is, uh, I think it's it's also super useful for our RAL is, you know, maybe a single sample from the model isn't very good, but if you predict like ten different things, uh, it turns out that one of the ten. Uh, that's right. Is the probability is much higher. So there's these passive key curves, and you know part of RL like what what RL does is, you know, you can you can exploit this passive key phenomena to to make many different predictions. And and uh, one one way to think about this, the model sort of knows internally has like has some uncertainty over like which of the key things is correct, or like which of the key things does the human want. So when we RL our uh, you know cursor tab model. One of the things we're doing is we're predicting which, like, which of the hundred different suggestions the model produces is more amenable for humans. Like, which of them do humans more like than other things? Uh, maybe, maybe like, there's something where the model can predict very far ahead versus like a little bit, and maybe somewhere in the middle, and and you know, just and then you can give a reward to the things that humans would like more, and and sort of 
punish the things that it would like and sort of then train the model to output the suggestions that humans would like more. You, you have these like RL loops that are very useful that exploit these passive K curves. Um, Oman maybe can, can go into even more detail. Yeah, it's a little, it is a little different than speed. Um, but I mean, like technically you tie it back in because you can get away with the smaller model if you RL your smaller model and it gets the same performance as, as the bigger one. Um, that's like, and, and, and so while I was mentioning stuff about KV, about reducing the size of your KV cache, there, there are other techniques there as well that are really helpful for speed. Um, so kind of back in the day, like all the way two years ago, uh, people mainly use multi-head attention. Um, and I think there's been a migration towards more uh, efficient attention schemes like group query um, or multi-query attention. And this is really helpful for then uh, with larger batch sizes, being able to generate the tokens much faster. The interesting thing here is um, this now has no effect on that uh, time to first token prefill speed. Uh, the thing this matters for is uh, now generating tokens. And, and why is that? Because when you're generating tokens, instead of uh, being bottlenecked by doing these super parallelizable matrix multiplies across all your tokens, you're bottlenecked by how quickly, it's for long context um, with large batch sizes, by how quickly you can read those cache keys and values. Um, and so then how uh, that, that's memory bandwidth and how can we make this faster? We can try to compress the size of these keys and values. So multi-query attention is the most aggressive of these, um, where normally with multi-head attention, you have some number of quote unquote attention heads um, and some number of kind of query query heads. Uh, Multi-query just preserves the query heads, gets rid of all the key value heads. Um, so there's only one kind of key value head and there's all the remaining uh, query heads. With group query, um, you instead, you know, preserve all the query heads and then your keys and values are kind of, in, uh, there are fewer heads for the keys and values, but it, you're not reducing it to just one. Um, but anyways, like the whole point here is you're just reducing the size of your KV cache. And then there is uh, MLA. Yeah, multi-latent. Um, that's a little more complicated. And the way that this works is it kind of turns the entirety of your keys and values across all your heads into this kind of one latent vector that is then kind of expanded inference time. But MLA is from this company uh, called DeepSeek. Um, it's, it's quite an interesting algorithm. Uh, maybe the key idea is sort of uh, in both MQA uh, and in other places, what you're doing is you're sort of reducing the uh, num like the number of KV heads. And the advantage you get from that is is you know there's less of them, but uh, maybe the theory is that you actually want a lot of different. Uh, like you want each of the, the keys and values to actually be different. So one way to reduce the size is you keep uh, one big shared vector for all the keys and values, and then you have smaller vectors for every single token so that when you you can you can store the only the smaller thing as some sort of like low rank reduction. And the low rank reduction will that, and at the end of the time, when you when you eventually want to compute the final thing, uh, remember that like your memory bound, which means that like you still have some some compute left that you can use for these things. And so if you can expand the um, the latent vector back out and, and somehow like this is far more efficient because just like you're reducing like, for example, maybe you know, like reducing like 32 or something like the size of the vector that you're keeping. Yeah, there's perhaps some richness in having a separate uh, set of keys and values and query that kind of pairwise match up versus compressing that all into one and that interaction at least. Okay, and all of that is dealing with uh, being memory bound. Yeah. And what, I mean, ultimately, how does that map to the user experience? Trying to get the thing. Yeah, the, the two things that it maps to is you can now make your cache a lot larger because you've less space allocated for the KV cache, you can maybe cache a lot more aggressively and a lot more things. So you get more cache hits, which are helpful for reducing the time to first token for the reasons that were kind of described earlier. And then the second being when you start doing inference with more and more requests and larger and larger batch sizes, you don't see much of a slowdown in as it's generating the tokens, the speed of that. Well, it also allows you to make your prompt bigger for certain. Yeah, things. yeah. So it, like, 
the basic the size of your KV cache is uh, both the size of all your prompts multiplied by the number of prompts being processed in parallel. So you could increase either of those dimensions, right? The batch size or the size of your prompts without degrading the latency of generating tokens. Arvid, you wrote a blog post, Shadow Workspace, yep. iterating on code in the background. Yeah. So what's going on? Uh, so to be clear, we want there to be a lot of stuff stuff happening in the background, and we're experimenting with a lot of things. Uh, right now, uh, we don't have much of that happening, other than like the the cache warming or like you know uh, figuring out the right context to, that goes into your command gate prompts, for example. Uh, but the idea is, if you can actually spend computation in the background, then you can help um, help the user maybe like at a slightly longer time horizon than just predicting the next few lines that you're going to make, but actually like in the next 10 minutes, what are you going to make? And by doing it in the background, you can spend more comp computation doing that. And so the idea of the shadow workspace that, that we implemented and we use it internally for like experiments um, is that to actually get advantage of doing stuff in the background, you want some kind of feedback signal to give, give back to the model. Because otherwise, like you can get higher performance by just letting the model think for longer. Um, and, and so like O1 is a good example of that. But another way you can improve performance is by letting the model iterate and get feedback. And, and, and so one very important piece of feedback when you're a programmer is um, the language server, which is uh, this thing, it exists uh, for most different languages, and there's like a separate language server per language. And it can tell you, you know, you're using the wrong type here, and then gives you an error. Or it can allow you to go to definition and sort of understands the structure of your code. So language servers are extensions developed by, like there's a TypeScript language server developed by the TypeScript people, a Rust language server developed by the Rust people, and then they all inter interface over the language server protocol to VS Code. So that VS Code doesn't need to have all of the different languages built into VS Code, but rather, uh, you can use the existing compiler infra infrastructure for linting purposes. What it's what? for? It's for linting. It's for going to definition, uh, and for like seeing the the right types that you're using. Um, so it's doing like type checking also. Yes, type checking and and going to references. Um, and that's like when you're working in a big project, you you kind of need that. If you if you don't have that, it's like really hard to to code in a big project. Can you say again how that's being used inside Cursor? The the language server protocol communication yes. thing. So it's being used in Cursor to show to the programmer, just like in VS Code. But then the idea is you want to show that same information to the models, the IO models. Um, and you want to do that in a way that doesn't affect the user, because you want to do it in background. And so uh, the idea behind the shadow workspace was, OK, like one way we can do this is um, we spawn a separate window of Cursor that's hidden, and so you, you can set this flag and an electron is hidden. There is a window, but you don't actually see it. And inside of this window, uh, the AI agents can modify code however they want, um, as long as they don't save it, because it's still the same folder, um, and then can get feedback from, from the linters and go to definition and, and iterate on their code. So like literally run everything in the background, like as if, right. Yeah. Maybe, maybe even run the code. Uh, like so that? that's <laughs> the uh, eventual version. Okay. And that's what you want. And a lot of the blog post is actually about how do you make that happen? Because it's a little bit tricky. You want it to be on the user's machine so that it exactly mirrors the user's environment. And then on Linux, you can do this cool thing where you can actually mirror the file system and have the... AI make changes to the files and, and it thinks that it's operating on the file level, but actually that's stored in in memory and you you can uh, create this kernel extension to, to make it work. Um, whereas on Mac and Windows, it's a little bit more difficult uh, and and uh, but it's it's a fun technical problem. Yeah. So that's why right one there. one maybe hacky but interesting idea that I like is holding a lock on saving. And so basically you can then have the language model kind of hold the lock on, on saving to disk. And then instead of you operating in the ground truth version of the files uh, that are saved to disk, you, you actually are operating what was the shadow workspace before and these unsaved things that only exist in memory that you still get linter errors for and you can code in. And then when you try to maybe run code, it's just like there's a small warning that, that there's a lock. And then you kind of will take back the lock from the language server if you're trying to do things concurrently or from the, the shadow workspace if you're trying to do things concurrently. 